Welcome to the Every Brain Matters podcast. It's just pot. What's the problem? I'm your host, Aubrey Adams, and director of Every Brain Matters. This is part two of the Bren Spacer trial. Viewer discretion is advised. This podcast will talk about violent acts induced by the effects of cannabis. This is part two of the Bren Spacer trial. Bren Spacer is charged with involuntary manslaughter after she became violent during a cannabis induced psychosis episode. Psychosis is when a person has a break from reality and can experience paranoia, hallucinations, or delusions. Not everybody who experiences psychosis becomes violent, but some do. And Bren did that day, which ended up in the death of Chad Amelia. Today, we talk to leading advocates, Jesse LeBlanc, who's become an expert on the chemistry and the history of marijuana, Heidi Anderson Swan, and Dr. Christy Brown, who are attending the Bren Spacer trial every day. We are the only organization that has advocates in the courtroom taking notes and witnessing this historic trial. Christy, do you want to talk or add anything to the testimony of Vinny and Michael, the roommates of Chad? Um, Yes, I think that some other things that came out in the testimony were about Chad. And it was interesting that the two roommates when asked about Chad, they had a lot of positive things to say about him, that he was a nice guy, he was ambitious, they enjoyed talking to him, and so forth. But when you when the defense questioned them, they brought up some things that, that they had said upon being interrogated by the detectives that he had an anger problem and that he also was a daily, daily user of marijuana that he would use marijuana more than once a day sometimes, and that he seemed to be almost obsessed with marijuana. He had that huge bong in his room, uh, in the, uh, sorry, in the living room. And he, uh, one of them said he was mean if he didn't have his medicine. He could be mean if he didn't have his medicine, use the word mean and medicine. So he, he had a medical card supposedly use the marijuana for medicine, but we never found out what, you know, what his problem was that he needed to use it as medicine. And Vinny even said that he thought it was problematic that Chad was using so much marijuana. And that was something that didn't come out in any of the news articles before the trial started. So I think the defense was trying to paint a picture of Chad that was, he wasn't this, this, this perfect person, that he had his own issues and also that he might have had his own problem with marijuana. Um, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to play with the jury, um, whether it's going to seem like they're trying to, you know, accuse the victim. Um, But it did show that that Chad had experience with marijuana, that whatever marijuana or the way he was preparing the bong, he would um, be able to have tolerance for it, which is something that was mentioned later. But that Bryn and Vinny did not have the tolerance. And the other thing is when um, Chad found out about the, or when when he got these other people uh, high and they went into their, you know, panic and everything, he sort of laughed it off. So as an experienced user, he didn't, he just said, well, it's a bad trip and you're gonna get over it. And so he didn't take it seriously. So that was another thing that came up from the questioning. And then uh, finally, when Michael, Michael was upstairs in the master bedroom and he had taken a sleeping pill and he had earphones on. So he was not really, you know, a very pertinent witness because he didn't. The only thing he saw was the dog in the bedroom was the detectives put him in the, the dog in the bedroom and he had blood all over him from the stabbing, which was really sad. 
Um, but also um, Michael had had a fight with Chad because they had been on the beach earlier that day. And um, Michael had a girlfriend there and Chad had sort of monopolized the girlfriend. So Michael got angry at Chad and so they had a little tiff. Um, and that was brought out by the defense, but the redirect said that they had made up, you know, so um, Michael was not, I don't think a terribly significant witness, but Vinny was a very, very important witness, I think, um, as to the fact that he had that episode prior. Right. I, I can talk about the medical examiner, but first um, they had brought, they had tested some of the marijuana in house and then they sent out um, to Pennsylvania to another lab to test the percentage of THC. So in their testing of three samples in Ventura County, they found that only THC was in the samples. And then um, the Pennsylvania lab found that it was 4% THC. And the um, defense had been trying to suggest that there was something else in the bong besides a you know, very um, low, low level of THC, not very much THC in there. But they got an email from the Pennsylvania lab that said that since 2018, they had perfected their testing and they could have tested another compound, THCA. And I'm not an expert pharmacologist, but they said that that upon burning became Delta 9 THC. Mm. So they said that it could be that there was more like around 12 to 16 percent THC in the marijuana, which gave cred more credence to the defense's idea that the marijuana was stronger than 4% THC. And then finally, that woman who was testifying said she really couldn't tell how much uh, percentage of THC was actually there because they hadn't tested that THCA. So it, you know, it was basically, well, we tested this, this marijuana, but we can't really know that that was even what they used because it was in a, in a you know, like little jar. It wasn't clear that that was what they had been smoking, um, you know, in terms of hard evidence. They were just surmising that it was. And so the defense, it left an opening for the defense to suggest that maybe um, Chad had put something else in the bong. Um, but an interesting thing was that Christine Miller had suggested that the way he prepared the bong um, could have made it much stronger. And she, you know, gave some anecdotal evidence of that when people mix up and put a lot more smoke in the bong, it can have a much stronger effect. So um, the toxicology um, was not very useful for determining how much was in the bong. And then the, um, they did tox reports on Chad and Bryn, but the, um, they were careful to say that that didn't necessarily indicate how much they had in, you know, ingested when, they, when she had this psychotic episode. So she was, it wasn't clear um, how, much, how strong it was when she, when she actually was in the psychotic episode. And they said that um, the, the um, most effect of the THC comes between 10 and 30 minutes after ingesting the THC. So that corresponds exactly to the time period when she was in the highest level of psychotic um, behavior. So um, that confirms, you know, that, that that would have been the time when she was the most affected by the THC. So that's the tox toxicology report. So, so just to summarize, they, the only drug in, um, that was involved was THC. Um, the active right. chemical in the cannabis plant and that they can't really determine the potency of the THC. Um, but we know through studies, it's just 10 milligrams can induce the psychotic symptoms. And then, and then they talk about the THCA. Jesse, did you want to, did you want to comment on anything about that? Yeah. I mean, I have a presentation I gave and I, 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 it's been, it's in a couple presentations, but let me just read something to you. So, however, it's important to know that many cannabinoids in the plant are in an acid form. That's a THCA and also T CBDA, and they're not psychoactive in their natural form. The acid forms, it, it's a basically what they call is a car carboxyl group. It's a carbon atom, two oxygen, one hydrogen atom attached to the THC molecule. So it's THCA. So 
it requires heat energy to activate the THCA into a drug, and it's known as decarboxylation. Without decarboxylation, these molecules cannot readily pass through the blood-brain barrier, so that activation of the appropriate receptors can take place. This, however, it can occur rapidly when a product is smoked or vaped or during processing by the manufacturer. Basically, they process it at 220 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 to 45 minutes, which would be the case for edibles and other similar products. Also, decarboxylation can occur slowly during storage, including drying and fermentation. So basically, it's these, this carboxyl acid group that's attached to the THC molecule that think about it get broken away. And then it, that THC molecule is the key that can go into the receptor. So what Christy is saying is absolutely correct. When, you know, they might, when they tested the bong sample, it probably mostly was THCA, only 4% pure THC. But if, when, during the heating process in the bong, because they used, I don't know, what, what was he using? Some uh, blowtorch or something. I mean, that converts it to THC. So well, they didn't actually test the material in the bong for the amount, for the percentage of THC. They only tested it to see if it had anything other than THC. I got you. Yeah. Another, well, anyway. Another sample that they sent to the lab to test for, and they found the THCA, but it hadn't been combusted at that point. But they said it would have raised, if it had been smoked, right. it would have raised the level, just as you said. So that yeah, so that's, the, that's that. the chemistry behind it. So, yeah, and I've got a document on that if you ever want to read it or display it about that carboxylation process. And plus, the psychologists and the, the experts concurred that you don't have to have a large amount of THC to become psychotic. It can happen. You know, it's not as common, but it can happen. Yeah, but if he, I mean, think about it. He's got a bong, and it's probably got what wax in it gets heated up and that whole thing is filled up so who knows what the concentration was that's what the defense is trying to argue they mentioned wax several times they're trying to get illicit information about wax so um i guess we'll see if they can bring that in in they've only done they've only had one day so far but they're still not done with their yeah I, i'll give you this anecdotal piece i you know i had a drug bus by my house i had a dea agent there and he was saying part of their training they had to um actually grow marijuana plants and then they would smear the resin all on their skin and show people that it, it's not psychoactive but as soon as you heat it then it becomes psychoactive because it gets rid of that, right. that acid um that right. carboxyl group attached to it so anyway I, I don't know if that's helpful or not but there is yes, some very science, science and chemistry simple fairly simple chemistry behind it yeah yeah okay um that the Sergeant Matthew Oganowski um, went through the crime scene evidence and um, the blood, and um, there was a lot of blood. And the blood was concentrated in, in the area where Bryn was stabbing Chad, which was down below stairs and dining room, in this fairly small lower floor of the condo. And um, there at the kitchen, they showed the knife block where she took the knives. There were like five knives, five or six knives, and apparently she took out four of them. Um, and then um, one of them was the, the serrated blood knife that Heidi had referred to. And then they also showed the bong on the patio and the marijuana paraphernalia and the jar where they got the samples. And so that was the crime scene. Um, I think they just wanted to show how, you know, like the, the chair was overturned, the ottoman was overturned. They just wanted to show how there had been a struggle there. And then um, the medical examiner, um, Othan Mena, uh, talked about the 108 knife wounds. And he talked about some of them were slashing wounds, which were surface wounds. And they could have been you know, like one pass of the knife could have done more than than one, one wound. So it wasn't totally 108, it was just the way they classified it. But that there were a number of stab wounds that were lethal, like there were wounds to the heart, wounds to the lungs, wounds to the liver. 
and um, wounds to the neck, the carotid artery was severed and the jugular vein was severed. And there was, it was just a horrific, you know, um, crime. And, and they were saying that's one of the, you know, three or four worst um, crimes they had seen as far as a, a stabbing crime. Um, so I think the prosecution was trying to say, you know, this was a really horrible, you know, crime that happened and the jury will have to, you know, deal with that in whatever way they, they can think about that. Um, and the defense asked if it looked like it was something as a result of the, the, um, the wounds looked like they were caused by someone in a state of frenzy and, um, the medical examiner you know, trying to be objective, said he couldn't determine, you know, what kind of emotional state it was. But that's, you know, basically what he what he saw when he was doing the autopsy. And I don't know, Heidi, if you can think of anything else to say about the autopsy or the or the um, crime scene. Other than I would say that um, the pictures from the autopsy were really difficult to look at. And you could see where, you know, he was clean. I mean, we, we had seen a picture of him during opening statements um, of when he was, how he was found. And that was bloody um, and, uh, and, and splayed on, on the floor at the bottom of the stairs. And that was really so heartbreaking to see. And then to see him on this day um, where he was cleaned up, but the, but the cuts, the slashes, the stabs were clean and you could see. And I mean, it was it was very difficult. And I will say that um, when I got back to my hotel that, that night I cried. Um, it was really, uh, it was really painful um, to see. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what to say about that, that I, my heart just breaks for this whole situation. So thank you for being able to voice that. Um, Christy, is there another testimony you would like to talk about? Um, yeah, I, I got notes. I have notes on one of their testimony and then I think Heidi has um, some information about the, um, they uh, had an interview with Bryn shortly after, like a couple of days after she had been hospitalized. And I think she's going to talk about that and also the, the defense opening day. But the uh, prosecution had two more witnesses, which were the, their expert. And then this interview that this detective did with Bryn before they um, rested their case. So um, it's really interesting because the expert they had was very well qualified. He was a clinical psychologist who had testified in many cases, he worked with, um, you know, a forensic psychologist works with people who have committed crimes. He's done a lot of interviewing of them, but also has his clinical practice. And he talked at length about uh, marijuana and the adverse effects of marijuana and um, the fact that marijuana can cause cannabis induced psychosis and all the other adverse effects such as addiction that he sees in his clinical practice. And um, so he, you know, just went on and on about how much, how much work that he had done um, on these issues, violence, hostage negotiation, et cetera, et cetera. So um, he spent four and a half hours interviewing Bryn on, um, I think it was just recently, January 23rd of this year. Uh, because he had been asked to do so by the prosecution after the defense um, experts called this cannabis-induced psychosis. And he gave her some tests, one of them to determine if she was malingering or faking her psychosis, as some people do to get out of responsibility, and another one to determine her you know, personality. And he found that she was not faking, that she was telling the truth, um, he had, you know, examined all the body camera, the interviews and so forth. And he concluded that, yes, as the other experts have concluded, it was an episode of um, cannabis induced psychosis. And um, so he said that, um, you know, it's part of the DSM-5 and he went into substance induced psychosis and how it's different from just being intoxicated with 
THC and how you have to have hallucination. First of all, you have to have a substance that causes psychosis in your body. And then you have to have hallucinations or delusions, um, false beliefs, um, you know, irrational thoughts. And, you know, you assess all those kind of manifestations and, um, you know, whether then they can be bizarre or not, not bizarre, fixed false beliefs, like I'm dying or I'm dead. And, um, you know, after looking at all this, this information, she confirmed, conformed to like the highest level of psychosis, um, as far as, you know, differentiating it, not just mild psychosis. Um, so then he also looked at, did she have any other explanation for her behavior. So she didn't have any other history of mental illness. She didn't have any other motive um, to do what she was doing. And, and so he concluded that, um, you know, when you do a diagnosis, you have to rule it out everything else. He ruled out everything except cannabis induced psychosis. So this was indeed a case of cannabis induced psychosis. They also mentioned another case of a person named Calvin Sharp that he had weighed in on. And this, I looked up this case. This was a man who um, was uh, under the influence of cannabis, um, took a meat cleaver and killed his, I think it's girlfriend's son and um, um, injured her. And, um, you know, that was a case where he pleaded, um, you know, tried to plead guilty by reason of insanity. And he went before the judge. Um, he admitted the crime, but he wanted to get off on the insanity defense. The judge would not allow it. So he got life in prison. I think it was a different kind of case because it wasn't so clear that he didn't have motive because of the way he, you know, he was angry at the son and so forth. So I'm not sure how much you can correlate those two cases, but um, you know, um, it was another case of cannabis induced psychosis in Thousand Oaks era. It was either Thousand Oaks or Ventura, which um, they were they were referring to. Um, so there, are, you know, just so many cases that we've seen coming up. You know, just shows that this is not the only case. There, are, you know, other cases. Um, let me see. If there's anything else that? Um, uh, Heidi, can you think of anything else that um, Dr. Mohandi said? Um, I, I will check my notes, but I would uh, about that. But I want to hear what Jay has to say about another case in Thousand Oaks. Oh well, I mean Thousand Oaks, um, Ian David Long. I mean, we've got I've got the toxicology yeah. report. I mean, you all are aware of that. I can yeah. send you that info. But I, I don't know. Has they? This is from the UK, or is it yes. backwards? Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, yes. this is how thick it is. Yeah. This is case after case of cannabis-induced psychosis where there was a murder. Attacker smoked oh, yeah. cannabis by Ross Granger. He's the yeah. only one who's kind of gotten out there besides Alex Berenson. Mm -hmm. But this is, it's hard to read it. But I don't know if the defense mm -hmm. knows about this book. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's amazing the cases that he chronicalizes in here. Mm -hmm. And he's got a website. But. Uh, Jesse, can you describe David Long's case a little bit for us that you said he was only... Yeah, I mean, it was it 20, was it 2018, 2019? You know what, Jay, you know what is really um, interesting is that right before the trial began, um, they were on, on the news, they were reporting it had been five years since this mass murder. It, okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it was, it in was November, right before the trial was starting. And they're not talking about his toxicology report. I have a copy. I mean, I think all y'all have a copy of it. Maybe not Christy. Well, I don't know if I sent it to her. In, but I can send him. it out to you. And the whole like, DA, DA report. So um, let's, let's I think I read the report when it came out. Let's explain to the audience the, the, the situation here. Because they're not going to know what it is. Because we're the only ones that follow this. <laughs> so David, David Long went into was it a bar restaurant yeah borderline bar right in right. in thousand oaks california right. and he shot people with his is an ar-15 do we know what kind of rifle it was gun it was i don't i i thought it was a, a pistol like a glock but i'm not sure okay and then i, he, I don't you, you know i'd have to you know like i said i have the report available i haven't read up on it in a while i just know his toxicology 
All he had in it was caffeine, some metabolites from nicotine. So I guess he was smoking cigarettes and THC. That was it. Boom. Three of them. And do we know how many people he killed that night? It was a, I don't, I don't, I'd have to go back and look. I don't know. It was a lot. And I then, think it's 13, including him. Something like that. This was a bar that was attended by a lot of college students. So um, my son was going to Cal Lutheran at the time. And that's where some of the students who were killed were going. So it was, you know, like a major thing that happened at Cal Lutheran University at the time. Um, it was very tragic. Um, but the thing is, I also, I think, seem to remember that he had been, um, somebody had called for a welfare check for him just a few days before that. And his mother was very concerned about his mental state. And, you know, it's hard to know, like, how much he had been using marijuana previously or if there were any reports about that. I think it had been reported that he well, was using marijuana previously. I don't know if there's a report, but there's a interview with his high school and I remember he wasn't that old I mean he's in his early 20s so high school was just a few years before that I know he was in the Marines but right. his track coach said that he had kind of a I wouldn't say she said this directly but if you read her testimony he had a mean streak similar to what you're saying about this guy you yeah. know yeah but anyway he had a mean streak and that that whole interview is is eye-opening because it, it it it's typical of somebody I say it's typical, it's not proven anything, but it's somewhat indicative of he, him using, possibly using pot in high school because of his attitude towards his track coach. It, you know, it, it's just anecdotal. And our, and our hearts go out to the families involved in this tragedy too. I mean, this is just horrific. And David Long's mom, I, I can't imagine yeah. um, how she feels about this, especially after reaching out for help. Um, do we know, did David Long take his life or did the police shoot him or how did that end? Does anybody remember? No, I, I can't remember. We're going to have to, you know, let, have to look it up because they I'll just had that the memorial. Report. Yeah. While we were focusing on this case, they're having the memorial for that case, you know. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's quite interesting that they don't even talk about the factor of marijuana um, and um um, I think the public really needs to understand if it wasn't for the THC, these people would probably still be alive and, um, and maybe David could have gotten some help. So um, let's get yes. back. I think that yeah. one of the things about this case that is so, you know, it's not good, but we know the connection. Whereas in these other cases, the facts are somewhat obscured and we don't know his history. We don't know if he was, triggered, you know, in a marijuana uh, induced psychosis, or if he was, you know, going into schizophrenia or some other kind of mental illness when he committed that, that act. And so that's where we really need to know these things, but it's not being investigated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so there was just um, um, a couple things that I wanted to add with uh, Dr. Mahandi. And so first of all, that is that um, this was key, having him come in and do, um, and forgive me if, if I'm repeating, um, Christy, but um, getting him to do a personality test, one run one of those big long tests on Bryn uh, was one of the reasons for the delay in this trial. People talk about, oh, it's been years and years. And this was one of the delays to get the prosecution to do a, uh, a personality test, the MMR. Um, let me make sure I'm saying that correct. Um, anyway, so this was one of the reasons for the delay. And, um, and so he did, he conducted this test, he videotaped it, and he found um, that he, he his opinions converged with the uh, written uh, documentation from the defense experts, the defense uh, uh, psychological uh, psychiatric experts. And so his, um, his testimony was so important to the change the direction of this trial and reducing it to involuntary manslaughter. And he said that in his, um, his final opinion, was that, um, sorry, let me just uh, get my notes here. Um, 
and want to read what he said, his opinion, um, how much THC was in the product. One of the things that they said, do you, if you knew that she was uh, smoking 4.1% THC, would that change your opinion? He said, well, first of all, you don't know that's what she was smoking. He said, that's what was found on the crime scene. They could have used the good stuff before, and this was all that was left over. And he said, so that's one. And then two, um, he said that it wouldn't change, if it was 4.1%, that wouldn't change his opinion either. Because um, uh, even if she had low blood levels in her of THC in her blood, he said, um, this is uh, having an experience like this happens um, with inexperienced users. And so he said, no, that the, uh, the potency the THC did not um, have any any bearing on his opinion that she was in the throes of cannabis induced psychosis and that he thought that she was in like, a, as Christy said, one of the worst cases of it. Those are, are two good points that you're making. You know, it's not necessarily the potent one. It's the fact that it's THC, right? And just the more potent products just increase the risk. But right, right. THC so, low, low potency THC can cause psychosis. And then the other factor that I don't think that we mentioned yet is that Brim is an adult. She's over the age 25 or how old is she? 20. She, I think she was 27 at the time. So so the marijuana industry and the, the state legislators are saying that this is a safe product mm -hmm. for people to use over the age of 21. Mm -hmm. Right, and that it's only the kids that are at risk. We need to keep it away from the. But I think adults deserve to know that it's a game of Russian roulette with their brains too. Mm -hmm. Well, every all of them, and the the witness for the defense, the um, the psychiatrist, Doctor Worshing, said he tells everyone don't use before the age of thirty. And and Europe. when he and when he when he says that, does he give a amount of what you know? What is the dose? No, no, he doesn't say. And that is one of the things that, that we know is there's no safe dose. Yeah. We know a lot about alcohol. We know a lot about what, how much alcohol a person can have based on their age, sex, weight, how much they've eaten and, and a genetic risk. There's like so much data on it. We don't have that with marijuana. I mean, there is no safe amount and especially for youth, there is really no safe amount. And so, I mean, and this has to be understood by everyone. Yeah, and let's, and let's clarify too that we know that the science and the uh, the amount of alcohol that causes intoxication, right? right? And we're we're talking not just we're talking beyond intoxication with this cannabis. We're talking about psychosis and psychosis. Let's just let's define what psychosis is. Psychosis is a break from reality where a person mm -hmm. can experience hallucinations, paranoia, and delusions. So mm -hmm. when we're talking, when we're comparing alcohol to marijuana, you, you, there's just no common denominator. That's what, and that's another thing the industry has gotten away with. I was just doing some education in Ohio and their, their, their um, push to legalize there was like, just treat it like alcohol. Well, you can't treat this like alcohol yeah. because I asked, I asked you guys, can you take one swallow of alcohol and become psychotic? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. No, you can't. So this is what we need America and the world to know. Please listen to this podcast. Please listen to this video. This is not alcohol. We're not advocating for alcohol use. A uh -huh. lot of us work in and 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 do do education with drug prevention. You know, we we like we know life is better without intoxicating drugs. But you cannot compare marijuana to alcohol. It's totally different. One is a water soluble drug. One is a fat soluble drug. And you cannot become acutely psychotic by one swallow of alcohol, even if it's really strong alcohol or, mm -hmm. or you know, and you, you know, one hit off a of vape for marijuana can cause a psychotic episode. Obviously mm -hmm. one or two hits off a bong has caused a psychotic episode with brim mm -hmm. with devastating consequences with the life lost so so let me let me interject right here sure. just to go into it and christy um talked about this is how strong how how many 
technically that was one hit off of a very long bong, but he was prepping it for her to make sure that she felt it. So he was boiling it and breathing up the air, but keeping it in the chamber, boiling it, keeping it in with, I don't know the proper term for it, the, the mouthpiece in, you know, filling it up so that it what didn't look smoky, what it looked like was milk. That's how much, so how many hits was in that one tube when he sat there. She said it took him a very long time to to do this for her. He would kept packing it and you know and fluffing it. She said and then breathing it in and but not not taking it. And then he had it all packed, packed, packed with smoke. And then he passed it to her. So you so, you kind of froze up a little bit there, Heidi. So let's just summarize what you're talking about. Um, you're talking about Chad prepped the bong with a lot, a lot of hits in there and condense the smoke into the chamber for Brem yes. to take that really strong hit into the the tube into the mouthpiece so that when you know you see like the a long glass tube and you can see through it you can see the smoke in it he compacted it so much that it looked you know it was like milk and so it was so, cause, cause he kept making it cause he wanted to be sure she felt it because the first hit she said she didn't feel the second one. He was like, Oh, let's make sure you, you, you feel this one. And she was like, she wasn't really interested, but he really wanted to, to um, have her do this. So he prepped it and prepped it and prepped it and prepped it and kept doing it and doing it and, doing it and packing it up. So how many hits is that actually? How can you say that that was just a second hit? There might've been, I mean, how many hits were in that one? Uh, packed up amount of marijuana of smoke that he got in there and passed over to her yeah. and told her to take it. Well, and with no indication for her that this could have a profound effect on her. Right. When and he how, had already seen this is how what he did for Vinny, his roommate before, and there was a profound effect on him. And he didn't say, oh, by the way, this, you know, my, my roommate Vinny had a bad experience with this. I'm, you know, because he thought it was funny. So, um, you know, so he packed, so we don't know, was it just two hits? Can you technically call that two hits? Well, and, I, and, I and how much did she inhale? Because when you're right. smoking, when you're taking in smoke, you normally only take about 25% of the THC that's in that. That's mm -hmm. Like if mm -hmm. you're taking a hit off a joint or something. So those are all great questions, something to talk about and, and, and good job raising awareness about that, that he did. I didn't realize he compacted that bong with a bunch of uh, THC smoke. So they had an interview with her, which was the next testimony after this doctor, where um, she was at the hospital and the detective came and interviewed her. And um, I, Heidi, I don't know if you're ready to go over that interview that you did, took such sure. great notes on. Yeah. And the other thing that I want to say is this was um, all a part of the prosecution's opening statements. Um, that they very clearly, uh, the prosecution went through the steps of the night and what happened. So they uh, all the whole evening, which included what happened with Vinny and, um, you know, a couple of weeks prior and then that night and the steps and about how Bryn and um, and Chad went out on the porch to get high. And so um, we'll, we can hear more about that in the interview. But um, the prosecution did go over that in um, very good detail. Uh, in opening statements that day. So the overview is that when she, when uh, Bryn was in the hospital um, three days um, after the event, she was interviewed by uh, uh, Ventura County Sheriff uh, Cyrus uh, Zeda or Zeda. I'm not sure if I'm butchering his name. Zeda. Um, and it's Zeda. Mm -hmm. And um, and so he, she, he or she had had surgery um, to save her and um, she was in pain. And at some point a nurse comes in and asks her how her pain level is. And she says she's in pain. So she's getting treated for that. And she, at this point had already done interviews. And so uh, in the, the course of the interview, we find out that she's frustrated that she's having to go through all of this again, because she's already provided um, this information before. And it's a really hard thing for her to experience again. And um, some of her testimony or some of her answers to the sheriffs were um, written down on pieces of paper. And remember, the, the sheriffs were uh, hitting her with a baton to knock um, the knife out of her hand, so she, the, her right hand she couldn't use, so she was uh, writing with her her left hand, um, answering questions from 
uh, before detailing what happened that night. So this sheriff, he, he was tasked with hearing more about what she was thinking, what she was feeling, um, what she remembers, details. He really wanted her to paint the picture for him. And he said that repeatedly, give me as much information as you can to paint the picture so that I understand what you did, what this drug um, did to you and, and how you reacted and what you can remember because I need to pass this information on to the scientists um, and, and other, others as well. Um, and so um, their back and forth dialogue, um, she arrived around 10 or 10.30 at his house. Um, they had been dating and she was, um, and um, they had spent the night together before. And, um, and so it was not a regular thing, but it was kind of assumed that, that she would do so. And so she got there and uh, the two of them were hanging out and they were just watching South Park uh, together and they were uh, getting ready to go to bed. And he said that he was gonna go outside and have a smoke. And um, she, you know, and he was doing that because it, um, her dog was sensitive to the smoke. So he was doing it to be considerate of her dog. And so she went out and then she thought, well, um, hey, why don't I also have, um, try some. And that's where, um, you know, he kept, she said his out on the porch was where he kept his trumpet size uh, or where he had his trumpet size bong. And he had his little kit with, um, with things uh, for drugs that he had in there. And we later found out that there was a grinder and there was product and papers in his kit and um so let's see um was, she had she took a little uh a, a small a, a puff from it and it just it made her cough and that was a normal reaction for her and that was one of the things that she really dislikes about marijuana is that it always uh, made her throat burn and she just said generally she hates marijuana and um she'd only done it at that point maybe five times in her whole life. And that's a 28 year old, you know, and, and so um, they were just sitting there talking for a little while after she had had her puff and, and Chad had already had his. And um, then she was working on, he was working on getting himself another hit. And she mentioned that she didn't feel high at all. And he was curious as to why, um, why she wasn't feeling it. And she said, I wasn't interested in it and I never said yes or no but then he put more drugs in the bong from his little drug kit and um and then he fluffs it up and he keeps adding mixing it up and she says it happens so fast he he starts it up and you know he boiled it for a while like prepping it to get as much smoke in the bong and I knew it was a lot stronger because of all the smoke in it I cough a little as he start, oh, so then she took a hit and um, and she started to cough a little and he starts laughing and she gets up and it's it's not good coughing. And um, and so she she describes how she, um, you know, ran into the bathroom and she was coughing in there and he left her alone in there for quite some time. And this is the time where, you know, I, if he had taken her symptoms seriously, you know, he could have taken some action to, to help her that ultimately would have helped him. Um, but um, he, he didn't. And so in the audio testimony, she's, she's having a hard time telling the story and, um, and the, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Sergeant, uh, you know, encourages, is he a Sergeant? I'm sorry. Um, sheriff um, continues to ask her to keep on talking and encourages her that she's um, doing a good job and um, and he let's see and she talked about how it was you know normal that uh, the friends that she knew did it and so he was doing um, and so um, he asked her about the the, the products that were going in the bong itself, what did they look like? And she said green and brown and um, and uh, how he's, he, going back a little bit out of order, this interview goes back and forth in order. He had been building it up for a long time. And she said, once the tube was filled in white, then he says to take it. And he said to hold it all the way in her lungs. And, um, 
and, and then the she's asked by the sheriff, he said, did you use anything else that night? Allergy meds, anything? And she said, no. And um, she started coughing a lot. And uh, he was, and again, Chad was laughing at her, but she was like not paying attention so much to what he was doing because she was concerned about her own health. And she said that she felt like she had a big ball of air stuck in her throat. And it was something she had never uh, felt before. Um, the first hit was super small, but at this point her eyes were becoming bleary and watery. And he was out, um, uh, running around and or this is what she said um and uh then after coughing for a while she could tell that she was getting really high and she had never felt like this before and so she staggered her way back to the couch and with her eyes closed um and she couldn't and she just makes it to the living room and tried to fall asleep but um but she wasn't able to because while the high was happening um that she was starting to you know, have these really weird things happening in her head. And and Chad is um, half laughing at her because she's trying to have a serious conversation with him, but he's, um, he's dismissing it. And he said that, oh, you're having a deja vu conversation. And she said, stay awake because she was afraid she was going to die. And um, again, so here he is met with the same fear from another person who felt like they were going to die. And he didn't know enough to know that that is very serious. And he could have called 911 at this point. Um, and so she's, um, and and um, she started to see like metal things churning right in front of her eyes. It felt like it had been hours. And, and then she started to have visions of herself being dead. And she said, that's a hard thing to see. She could hear uh, voices of people trying to save her and she had a hard time talking about it and she's and, and it was hard to go into the details again she would stop and she would cry and he would um, you know try to and 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 I should mention and I have notes here that Bryn was crying in court uh, while this audio tape was was playing um, and in the interview she said she's just dealing with grieving and he can encourages Bryn to continue to describe what she what she felt. And so um, she said that she saw her mom crying in, in her visions. She saw that her mom was crying because she was dead. And she, this just kept cycling through her head. It felt like hours and every hour something was added and um, kept repeating itself. And, and she felt like people were trying to talk to her and she kept thinking, I'm dead. This is how dead people think. And he asked her if she was scared. She said, oh my God, yes, scared. I was, I was scared I'd be stuck in my body in the same cycle. And um, she heard voices of paramedics and she had um, the feelings that people were touching her dead body. And this kept happening for hours. And he said, you felt like you were a dream. And she said, a vision, I don't know. I don't know, it's blurry. And he said, it's okay, I know drugs impair you. And she didn't know where Chad was. He was somehow, she was in the kitchen. And all of a sudden she picked up knives and she threw them at Chad. And she said, it's so blurry, I couldn't see. I tried throwing chairs. I was trying to back off Chad. So, and he said, so he can't come towards you? She said, I can't see, it's so cloudy. Um, and I'd make my way towards Chad and then she stops and she sobs. I can't, I can't. And he asked, he said, are you face to face? And she said, uh, I was holding knives. And he said, I assume you start stabbing. She says, I don't remember. And he said, what's the last thing I remember? And she said, I heard voices telling me to fight, get past the hardest part to stay alive. And he said, if you, if you killed Chad, he would come back alive. Um, and then she, and then she started stabbing herself and and she said the more I heard the voices um uh she said face to face on the floor I'm trying to scream anything that hurt myself would keep me alive I was thinking about my family hurting me I don't remember stabbing Chad the closer I got to him um he said do you feel like you're closer to being alive and she said the voices said I had to intensify. It caused me to, I wanted to be successful. So I had to do something else. I don't know. And then she starts stabbing again. And she said that these details about myself, hurting myself more will keep me alive. The more I felt the electrical currents, it was working. So now all of a sudden we're at the part where the sheriffs are there tasing her. And so she felt like the electrical currents were, were helping her to get to uh, where she wanted to go, which was out of uh, her dead world. 
And um, so, and and I think, I don't think there's, um, she just thought she was in a dead world. And, um, and, and then she was asked, did you know it was wrong? Did you know what you were doing was wrong? And she said, there was blood everywhere. And I knew something was wrong. I was screaming for my life. Uh, there was a pause. I was shouting for my life, uh, describing every family member. I'm sorry, I am dead. I want to see my brothers get married, graduate, become a cop. I thought I effed up everything for them. And in the courtroom at this point, you know, the brothers are crying and hugging and it's just so painful. And she said she kept fell, feeling people touching her, her mom, her dog was on her lap. The more I hurt myself, the more I was almost there. Um, and, and so then she was asked, were, were you jealous of Chad? She said, no. And he said, um, the state you were in, would you ever hurt Chad? She said, no, I'm not jealous of him. I would have no reason to want to hurt him. And even if he were abusive, I would never have thought. Um, and it, this was just a way out of my control. Even that night, it was just something that was happening. Um, ever have thought to hurt? He asked her if she'd ever thought to hurt herself. And she said, no, there were times that she was lonely, you know, with her move to uh, California, a natural adult transition. And she was under a lot of pressure and she just didn't have as many friends out there. But even in those times, she had never thought of hurting herself. And um, she had always uh, thought of herself as a positive person. And she would do proactive things to call her family, to call friends, you know, when she felt that bad, but she never thought of hurting herself or anyone else. And she said, it was like I was dead. Um, she couldn't see. I know there was something, something bad happening. I was in a cycle. I am dead. And based on what I was seeing, um, and uh, let's see. And then she was hearing as as the violence was escalating, she was hearing um, voices. She said sometimes one voice, sometimes four. And they said, you got this. You're almost there. It was so believable, she said. And he asked, did, the interviewer asked, did Chad smoke the same thing? Um, and then she recounted again. In the second hit, it was almost like milk. He really, he said he really wanted me to feel it. And then the interviewer asked, do you remember seeing the roommate? Because remember, Vinny had come down the stairs and said, oh my God, Brim, what are you doing? And she, she, she said the only voice I heard was someone, um, and he said, someone stepped in and told you to stop. And then Bryn said, referring to Chad, she said, I'm surprised he didn't just hit me, just physically stop me, a combination that he was going to kill me. And so she, I mean, and so that's that's the, the trajectory of that audio interview. And, um, and I, I don't know, I kind of feel like uh, using um, that as opposed to just a, a simple synopsis really illustrates more of what that night was like. Wow, that's really intense. That's intense, isn't it? Yeah, that's really intense. You just want to sob, just sob here in that. That's, um, yeah. I relate that to that feeling of, of, I feel like I'm gonna die. That's the way I felt the last time I smoked marijuana when I was 16 years old. I thought mm -hmm. I was gonna die. That's all I thought. You did too? Oh yeah, hold on, hold on. Oh, wow. I just thought I'm going to die anytime and I was just trying to talk myself getting through it and knowing that I would never touch it ever again for the rest of my life. And when I did get through it, my boyfriend at the time, um, who turned into being my husband in my twenties, I told him, if you want to be with me, you can't be, you can't, we can't be around marijuana period. So I, I get that, that I wanted, I want, I felt like I was going to die. So well, that, can I say something? I mean, that was just so intense. It was even much more intense when you actually heard it because she didn't want to be talking about it. And she kept saying, no, I yeah. can't, no, I can't. And she was sobbing mm -hmm. during the whole interview. But one of the things I was wondering about is how could Chad, who is a large, rather large male, and she's a fairly small female, how could he just let her stab him? Now, he did have some defensive wounds, but that's one of the things the detectives yeah. asked. And she says, like, well, you know, I don't understand it either, why he couldn't, you know, defend himself from this attack. And then the only the one thing that she said is, well, he was high, too. 
So I wonder exactly what was happening with him. I think we'll never know because she was not able to coherently understand what was happening, how she could have overpowered Chad the way that she did. I think she would, her adrenaline must have been off the charts during this whole episode because she was just had like the superhuman strength. She couldn't, you know, she couldn't be stopped. She was going to do what she was going to do. Those commands, those voice commands to do this that were, you know, were controlling her at the time. Yeah, I wonder if uh, if Chad was caught off guard too. I mean, he was impaired, obviously. He was using himself, but I wonder if one of those first initial stab wounds was a fatal fatal wound. And oh, oh, that's a good point. That would explain a lot, wouldn't it? And that he was caught off guard thinking, you know, like he's, he's stoned, you know, and when you're stoned, you know, even people getting hurt can appear funny, you know, and he was already laughing at her having a good time. And so I just want to say for the record for Chad's family that, um, you know, we know people that are using marijuana aren't necessarily their genuine self and, um, and we're not victim shaming here or anything like oh, that. Um, no. He did not deserve any of this, whether he was a marijuana user or not. And um, and we just uh, we're just we're just a group of advocates that have 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 experiences like this, and we know how horrific it is. And our hearts go out to you um, with the circumstances of the loss of your 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 son. So we we honor Chad tonight yeah. and raise awareness yeah. that this doesn't happen again. Um, to prevent more tragedies like this happening. And I think that Chad's father expressed that too about Bryn on News Nation, that they were both, you know, like had bright futures and they're both, you know, severely impacted by this whole, you know, thing. I mean, her, his son absolutely fatally, um, and, but it's just sort of a, a mystery, you know, that what, you know, actually happened, that this is when the prosecution rested their case. So. I think y'all will find this interesting in light of what Aubrey said and what, what, you know, Christy and you, Heidi, said. Okay, a very similar case in India was reported by Chopper in 1971. CS, age 34, school, I'm sorry, 37, a school teacher, out of curiosity, took 15 grains of bang in the company of his brother, who consumed 360 grains. He had never taken a drug before. While his brother felt happy, exhilarated, and high, he felt dizzy and experienced a sinking sensation and felt like he was going to die. Mm. Okay. I mean, there's more, a little bit more, but, you know, I, I just have, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. That's in this book on a case in 1971. It's probably would be considered low dosage THC if it would even be mm -hmm. marketable today. So... Mm -hmm. Same thing. I, I just um, thought that me, was amazing when I when I, I saw that earlier, and I'm thinking they keep saying I felt like I was going to die. That's mm -hmm. what they have here on, and it's at the bottom of page two thirty three. If you want to read it, Heidi, later. That's yeah. that's all and, I wanted you know, to say. CNN it, has like a, a a one of their favorite um, things they reported on um, is like somebody calling into a news station who's stoned, saying they think they're going to die, and yeah. CNN laughs about that. And yeah. um, and Saturday Night Live has a skit that they did where people are at a party, they're getting stoned or having brownies or something, and each one calls nine one one, reporting they're going to die, and that's the skit. That's the funny skit. And because there is no balance, because we've all said, oh, the war on drugs has failed, nobody says anything, and so Chad was not privy to any information that I'm going to die is a really bad thing. Somebody thinks that. Um, and, and so he, you know, had he had that information, he might be alive today if he knew I'm going to die is a bad warning instead of this funny thing that our culture is accepting with it and that the industry is allowing uh, it, and, and the media refuses to report on, except for to make it funny like this or like Sanjay Gupta's weed series, how great weed is. But he's not telling you about the side effects, is he? I just want to leave y'all with this last one. This is on page 220. And this is from Dr. Moreau in the 1850s. As Moreau recalls, recalls, seeing an open window in my room, I got the idea that if I wanted, I could throw myself from that window. 
Though I did not think I could commit such an act, I asked that the window be closed. I was afraid that I might get the idea of jumping out of the window. And it goes more, and on. I know I alluded to that earlier, but I found the passage. It's on page 220 in the middle. But that's 1850 hashish uh, that, you know, this doctor who's experimenting with it to kind of understand mental illness, what he experienced. The same, same exact thing. Yeah, yeah 1850. Mm hmm. 1850. And the. Um, uh, That's in that book, too, you have. Huh? It's in your in that book, too, you have. Page yes. 20. Yes. There's just so much. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, why? I mean, the big question I have, why aren't we learning from the mistakes of the past? I mean, we're just committing them again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, anyway, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that. That's just one of my pet peeves. Because our country. Yeah is picking money over the health and safety of their people. Exactly. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and this is one case out of many. We have people mm -hmm. going into schools, shooting schools up. And, and why we don't put our kids first is because our government is failing us and picking money over the health and safety of each and one of us, you know, going to the grocery store, anything like that can change your life forever because there could be a psychotic person with a gun in their hand. and um, mm -hmm. Or a knife. Or a knife, or a car, the Wakasa. Or a car. Or a car. That's the, walk, right. the Wakasa parade. Um, uh, right. Who, yeah. Right. So we will keep um, doing our part, taking the responsibility to um, share our experience, our knowledge, the science based, and um, to raise awareness to the best of our ability, um, make record of this, and, and hope that this uh, ship turns. And that we pick health and safety over drug money, um, where a few people get rich, why society pays the price. So here at Every Brain Matters, we literally feel every brain matters. Our brains, the trauma that we experience by this knowledge, um, the lack of um, voice that we we get shamed and blamed and poked fun at when we go. Um, we get we get blocked from doing presentations, as Heidi mentioned before. And um, well, we we are linking arms, the four of us here, right here today, linking arms, taking a stand, and we know we've got a broad network of people that stand with us. So join us at Every Brain Matters, learn about the harms of marijuana, learn about cannabis-induced psychosis, and know that those episodes of cannabis psychosis can end in violence and death. Not all of it, but it can. And so be informed and protect your brain, everybody. This is part two of the Bren Spatia trial. Please subscribe to our channel or our podcast for part three. The Every Brain Matters community's primary mission is to support and advocate for families harmed by today's industrialized marijuana. And we need to grow our efforts to provide this very important, essential, valuable education on the risks of using marijuana. Please visit our website at everybrainmatters.org and sign up for a monthly donation, just $10 a month will support our efforts to raise awareness about cannabis-induced psychosis. Please visit us at everybrainmatters.org.